Hello and welcome to the second episode of Dev Pro Women 2030. I'm Emma Smith, careers reporter with DevEx and based in our Barcelona office. And I'm Rebecca Root, a reporter and editorial associate at DevEx. I'm from the UK, but also went searching for some sunshine like Emma and now live here in Barcelona. And I guess, Emma, we can still say we're young, right? Youngish? Hope so. And I guess we're both looking to find out how the development sector is changing and what that might mean for women like us. Do we have the right skills, the right education? Are we ultimately fit to be a part of the next generation of development professionals? That's right. So throughout this series, we are looking to track down and talk to women from all over the world who are already striving towards leadership in the sector or have broken into previously male-dominated areas of development or can just tell us a little bit more about the changes they see happening in the development workforce. So today we're focusing on what's needed specifically for those top positions, the CEOs, presidents, heads of organizations, and the skills women need to hone to really break that glass ceiling. And what better way to do that than by talking to a female who's already a leader? Yes, so Nasra Ishmael has over 10 years of international development experience in Africa, Asia, and Europe. She's currently the deputy director of the Somalia NGO Consortium, but before that was the country director of Somalia for Oxfam International and spent eight years with the US government managing public sector programs. She's managed large-scale poverty reduction programs aimed at strengthening the capacity of local, regional and national governments in resource-constrained countries. She also holds a bachelor's degree from the George Washington University, as well as multiple professional certificates from top-tier universities like Harvard, Oxford and Berkeley. So not intimidating at all. (laughs) Yeah, she's definitely got a very impressive CV. So Rebecca, you chatted with Nasha a few weeks ago. Yeah, that's right. She gave us a call from Somalia and was full of so many wise words on how she's overcome some of the challenges she's faced in her career and the biggest lessons she's learned so far. Nazareth, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, As you know, we've been talking a lot about the changing landscape of development and how it's going to look in about 10 years time. Um, How do you hope things will differ, especially for women in 10 years time in this space? Thank you, Rebecca. I'm really happy to join you here from uh, Mogadishu, Somalia, to talk about this important uh, topic. Um, I I hope uh, in 10 years' time we really are at a better place for not only um, women's uh, ability to participate more fairly in the economic in the economy that they're uh, living in, but really that I hope we are better in terms of uh, meeting the. Uh, SDGs and the commitments we've made to make this world a bit better for everybody, particularly women who I think we all know have been marginalized to some extent for a long time. But my hope is uh, that in the next 10 years, things do get better uh, on all levels for women, for young people, for many people who have not been participating fully comprehensively in their uh, economies. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, And when you're thinking about like those top level positions, CEO, directors, vice presidents, I know you yourself are are a deputy director. Are there specific skills and education you think that women will need to access in order to be able to fill those positions? I happen to be of the opinion, and I think many people will, will agree, that in terms of skills, soft, as well as those perhaps found more readily in the uh, business sector, uh, women actually do accelerate uh, in terms of educational um, output. Women, young girls, do tend to be achieving more on that end, let's say, than compared to their uh, counterparts. I think uh, in terms of what might put many people, women and women, um, in the best shape to respond to the crises that we're seeing around the world, um, it, the, the, there is a common ground on what make any person, uh, particularly women leaders in this environment, more successful. Certainly, as the world is grappling with increasing its stability, sort of the negative side that we're seeing now in globalization, political extremism, if you will, but also the humanitarian crisis that the world is uh, challenged by, in order to solve the most challenging social ills, leaders, particularly women leaders, will need to have a sense of resilience, I think. Uh, it could never hurt to um, overperform in areas where things are very difficult, the environments may not be an enabling environment, so having a cachet and a rich uh, experience on how to be resilient to leader, this is something all of us are going to be asked to do in the next several years. 
Um, another point I would make is, and again, I do, I do not believe that women have a shortage of skills here, but I think where women's ability to lead, to transform sectors, to really address the social ills of, of the century that we're in, uh, one needs to be comfortable and a risk taker. And I think these are uh, values, these are qualities that we see are being required in the sector that I'm in, humanitarian development, but are being required in any other setting as the world continues to be shaped by what we are seeing uh, around the world. And so I would say those two things really would be critical for anybody to be successful in the business world and in the workplace. Tell us a little bit about your particular journey, because I know that you're now a deputy director at the Somalia NGO Consortium, but you've also worked for Ox Oxfam International and been in the sector for over 10 years. Are there challenges that you've faced in rising to that level of position? I, I would say yes, and, and uh, definitely many of my colleagues, many of my peers, many of them women, uh, would share the same uh, challenges. I think part of it really... Um, can be described in one of three ways. One of it is I've had the privilege of going from uh, a development background, now coming into a humanitarian sector. I would say both uh, areas of specialty do offer opportunities and challenges for women leaders. Um, things that were a bit more uh, easier for me when I was coming from Washington, D.C., really looking to work in the public sector, where um, it seems both regulatory, but in terms of culture as well, we had a more inviting environment, I would say, for more female leadership, for more leadership around um, inclusion and diversity. But I think depending on where we are, I've also been challenged in different ways in the sector that I'm in now, um, leading a network of uh, 100 civil society and uh, non non-for-profit organizations in Somalia, challenging environment, a uh, fragile environment where you do see the differences in terms of how the environment can pose very specific challenges to women uh, in general, but particularly women leadership. I went from uh, having a comfortable post in Washington, D.C., living around the metro uh, center area to now being in a guest house, uh, full arm uh, security uh, uh, to accompany me because it is, it is a location that poses a number of security challenges and then to see how that space uh, often does perform uh, better for you know uh, unaccompanied colleagues of mine or colleagues who uh, just happen to fit in uh, into the more patriarchal culture that we are in. So I think the challenges for me have been different at every stage, certainly challenges within uh, a very competitive place like Washington, D.C. It's offered me an opportunity to stand out, to really leverage my skill. Uh, often what you find in these sectors is uh, it's your uniqueness that can perhaps displace you, but I really have been able to use it uh, as an opportunity to bring my difference to the workplace and to lead uh, with the vision that it is a difference um, that improves me and improves the culture and improves the workplace rather than a difference that um, silos me. I think in, in this sector that I'm in, in the humanitarian sector, we have a lot of work to do to ensure that leaders of all um, shape, color, uh, background are able to thrive, but particularly in a fragile context like this, we see a lot of um, barriers in terms of women's leadership, legally, regulatory-wise, but also in terms of cultural barriers. Uh, these are huge, huge problems. So in order for female empowerment to thrive, we need to be very ca cautious of uh, cognizant around what the context is able to do and then how to move that context forward. And, and you touched upon context a little bit there. Do you think that women from the global south face a different set of challenges to women perhaps from the global north in terms of trying to strive for those leadership positions? I think it's an added burden for sure. Um, I mentioned that I think obviously there is now more than ever um, a belief and a collective uh, commitment to deliver for women and girls around uh, this planet that it's really um, uh, this is a time for us to act on that, whether you are addressing social development, humanitarian, legal issues, it doesn't matter. We are seeing an unproportionate amount of burden on women and girls. Um, obviously, the context uh, do highlight and perhaps serve as different issues for different constituencies, but for sure, global women in the global south um, can have a lot to benefit from those triumphant and those policies, progressive policies that have enabled more women in the global north to thrive, to, to have increasing numbers in, in the C-suites in the organizations that are in the global north. But for sure, the three barriers that are still relevant, that are still holding many women back 
in the context that I'm in is really uh, um, it, it, our, our legal uh, at one point in terms of having policies and laws that can allow women to have their fair share in their uh, inheritance, a fair share in participating in the economies that they're in uh, as employees, but also in terms of business women. And then this relates to the second barrier that I wanted to mention, which is if you don't have a legal barrier, you definitely have a regulatory barrier in terms of how businesses, civil society organizations owned by women are treated, are uh, given uh, access to finances and, and, and um, how they thrive in a community that may be restrictive again uh, to, to women. And third and the hardest one to breach and, and to uh, change is definitely the cultural barriers. So I think for me those three seem to still be an opportunity for all of us to improve on in the global south. And uh, the starting point may be this could be a coalition among um, those of us who work in the sector, but particularly could also be a, co uh, a coalition between women in the north and women in the south. And, and as a role model um, and a, a female leader in development and the humanitarian sector, are there top lessons that you, you've learned already or that you're still learning that you would like to pass on to the next generation of women professionals working in development or the humanitarian space? Uh, absolutely. There are many lessons. And to me, as a, as a leader, I continue to practice them and share them uh, with a number of uh, people who are both my mentors but also mentees. Um, I think a few that I'll just mention, obviously it's something that I've heard from my mentors when I was younger. Any one of us who's in a leadership position really need to be able to uh, speak on those constituencies, um, need, need, need to speak on behalf of all those constituencies that we belong to and that we speak for. So really taking very seriously the role of representing one's um, community very well. Uh, that always helps to focus uh, my, my strategies, focus my ability to lead uh, 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 on, on behalf of the communities that I work with, but also uh, to be authentic as much as I possibly can. I also said um, that there's a need to really uh, stop some of the jargons around female or male leadership. There's just good leadership, and we need to all of us invest in good leadership. So I tell many of those um, who I work with and those who will come after me, um, to really invest in leadership skills, uh, invest in having an executive coach, to have someone uh, who can give you that feedback to continue to improve on yourself and improve on the goals of your organization. Uh, certainly, I also mention that uh, any one of us, in order for us to be successful, we need to make ourselves um, and our skills valuable, valued, but also indispensable. It's a very competitive world we're all working in, and so uh, being very uh, serious about um, how you show up, how your skills uh, are able to address the issues that your organization is dealing with, those are very, very important. Uh, an important uh, uh, skill for me that I've been able to hone, that I continue to invest in, and that has helped me very much implement the vision uh, for uh, my organization has been an alliance and coalition making. Uh, we assume we can, in this culture of ours around the world, we can do it by ourselves, but I really don't think we can achieve something great uh, and grand on behalf of the world uh, by doing it by ourselves. And so I believe in being very uh, intent on alliance making and coalition making and having that as a platform that you can work out any of the complex issues that the world is facing. So needing to ensure that you work well with other people, that you can collaborate very well with differing voices, and that you can communicate successfully across differences. Um, last thing I'll say is I have uh, on my board when I get to the office um, and in, in my home office is, you know, a, a quote by Wangari Mathai, the late Nobel Prize winning Wangari Mathai, that she says, there comes a time when humanity is called to shift to a new level of consciousness and she says that time is now and I believe for everyone's ability to thrive in a better world that we can deliver for our young kids, our young girls who are all looking up to us to model a new way for leadership but also for fellowship that uh, we need to raise the consciousness of how we work, how we lead and how we live our lives. Great. Thank you, Nazra. That's, that's all of my questions and um, it's been so great to talk to you and to get your perspective. So thank you so much for speaking to us. Wow, so really interesting to hear about Nashra's experience, um, particularly moving from the HQ roles in the US to the, the more fragile context that she has to work in, and then the different challenges that face women in leadership positions in the global south. Yeah, and I particularly like what she said about not talking about women in leadership, just talking about leadership. I thought that was definitely some food for thought. 
So I think that's a good note to end it on. And that's us for today. But thank you so much for everyone to everyone for listening. And we'll be back in two months with our next episode. In the meantime, you can find out more about the DevPro 2030 series powered by 2U at devx.com. You can follow us for updates on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter using at devx and join the conversation using hashtag devpro2030.